My name's Paul Bestall. This is Mysteries and Monsters on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. This week's show is dedicated to Kevin Malick. Our sincere condolences to his wife Jennifer, his family and his friends. Rest in peace, Kevin. Welcome to the final episode of Mysteries and Monsters for 2019. Before we join our final guest this year, which is David Weatherly, I just wanted to thank anyone who has supported us, downloaded an episode or followed us on social media this year. 12 months ago, this all seemed like a million miles away. So to have hit 46 episodes and to see the show keep growing month on month is simply staggering. I, along with my brother Dean, who does all the art, and my social media manager Richard, who looks after the Twitter, the Facebook, the YouTube and the Instagram especially, could never have imagined we could have reached the number of people we have done this year. We've had almost 50,000 downloads, which is, and it might not seem a lot to some more established podcasts, but for a a bloke with a whim, recording this in a room in Sheffield on his own, uh, it's just an incredible number. So thank you to each and every single one of you that may have downloaded an episode whether you meant to or not. <laughs> I've been very fortunate to have spoken to some of the most respected people in the world of Fortiana. We've covered UFOs, cryptids, Bigfoot, poltergeists, ABCs, lake monsters, Tasmanian tigers, and even paranormal events witnessed by the police. When we started all this, me and Richard, we had 250 likes on our Facebook group. We're about 50 off 12,000 now. And that's a lot to do with both the show and Richard's hard work. So uh, it's just another incredible statistic in a, in a very humbling year. We've had downloads on every continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica. So I'll, perhaps I need to do an episode on the thing. Maybe to rectify that, that uh, zero in the continent mark but to be serious I see countries across the world in the stats and it just stuns me that people are listening to this show all around the world so thank you one and all for your continued support and I can promise you that things are only going to get bigger and better for Mysteries and Monsters in 2020 I especially want to thank Brennan and Ian over at the Ghost Story guys Seth Breedlove for always being available whenever he's got a film and he's very prolific and he still finds time for me so thank you to Seth and the Small Town guys Shannon Legro, who's the main inspiration for wanting to dip my toe in the world of podcasting Ryan Sprague, Sam Sheeran Jonathan Gerlock, Mary Elizabeth Supranant and Melissa Martell and finally along with my family and my partner Julie thank you very much guys Right, anyway, that's enough of me waffling on. Let's talk about this week's final show. So we're joined by David Weatherly. And David is here to discuss his fantastic book, Eerie Companions, which covers the haunted history of several well-known dolls. We cover all the famous alleged haunted dolls, including my new favourite, Mr Creepy. So if you haven't heard him, I think you're going to enjoy that story especially if you're an old romantic like me. And a big thank you to June Nixon over at the Advanced Ghost Hunters of Seattle, Tacoma for allowing us to use her picture of Mr Creepy for this week's show art. Thanks, June. 
other than that, you know where to find us by now. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram and Twitter as Mystery Monsters. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We've got 150, which may not sound a lot, but 10 months ago we had none. So that's just, that for us is an incredible achievement. So if you've got a YouTube channel, please join us on there. You can also support us on Patreon for a dollar a month. And other than that, thank you again. And here's to 2020. Now it's time to join David Weatherly. We are delighted to welcome back author, investigator and paranormal expert David Weatherly to the show to discuss one of our most requested topics, haunted dolls. David has covered this fascinating subject in his most recent book, Eerie Companions, and we welcome him with a little doll-induced trepidation back to Mysteries and Monsters. David, welcome. Paul, how are you doing, my friend? I am very well. How's things finding you today? Fantastic. It's another beautiful day. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> As we fight fight off the uh, the effects of the British winter. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you're getting a bit of a tan on my, on my behalf, sir. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, eerie Companions, Haunted Dolls, um, primarily over the last sort of 10 years, I would suspect, it's probably one of the aspects of the paranormal that's really come to the fore, David. As someone that's been involved in, in writing and investigating the paranormal and, and 14 subjects, what would you kind of say caused this modern explosion? Or do you think it was a drip drip effect and then it's just kind of naturally crossed over? Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, the perfect storm, if you will, because we've had a situation where the paranormal has become more acceptable, if you will, in the past 10 years. And that has sort of dovetailed with people diving into particular aspects of uh, of the topic. So, you know, we've had all these, quote, specialists in the last several years who have really spent a lot, a lot of time focusing on one particular uh, part of the, the paranormal as a whole. So, for instance, there are a lot of people who are, for some reason, very, very fascinated with demons and demonology and the whole lore that goes with that. Mm. And... Of course, along the way, there's there's been this rise in people who were interested in haunted objects in general, uh, because we do have some pretty crazy and, and fascinating stories about different objects throughout history that are purportedly cursed or haunted. And when we start looking at that aspect of hauntings and the supernatural, you know, we almost immediately go to dolls uh, because you bring in another perspective on that there are a lot of people who have a fear of dolls it, it's it's probably one of the the most well-known phobias and um, maybe one of the most widespread and there are a lot of aspects to that phobia you know a lot of different things that are grouped under that uh, but it it is a very widespread fear and and beyond the people who have a phobia about dolls there's also this um, this concept that a lot of people have or this feeling that a lot of have that a lot of people have that dolls are creepy in general, even if they don't have a phobia of dolls. Mm. You know, I've talked to people who they'll tell you, no, I'm not afraid of dolls, but I do think they're creepy. Mm. So, you know, we look at all these different aspects and I think it's kind of brought us to this this sort of culmination. And there's there's so many different streams that fed into it really over the years. I, I mean, we could also add in that you know dolls have been used for a long time in horror movies mm. to to a very good degree uh, you know to, to great effect and that of course plays into the whole dynamic of how people feel about dolls yeah very much so i think personally speaking i'm one of those people david that has a specific dislike of a certain type of doll um, which is ventriloquists dummies i've i've never been keen on them and i blame it all on watching magic as a young man um, <laughs> oh yes <laughs> which uh, i still think is one of the creepiest horror films i've seen especially in the in in the world of weird dolls but we'll we'll talk about that later because there's a, a wonderful chapter in the book covering some of the classic films throughout the years um but it it does seem peculiar as you refer to there that 
there are certain aspects of a doll that other people find creepy. Like I say, I'm I'm not saying I'm all right with certain other haunted dolls, but it's the ventriloquist dummy that that really puts the shivers up me. I'm not a fan of them, and I know <laughs> certain people don't like cloth dolls and they don't like porcelain doll. I mean, it's it, it, that's quite unusual in itself, isn't it? It it is, and you know, uh, Paul, I, I guess we're going to have to talk about Mister Creepy today, aren't we? Oh yes, he's on my <laughs> list. The love lawn man, bless him. <laughs> so yeah, so here's the thing, you know, there's there's a the phobia, um, there's the, pedophobia is what all of this stuff is is technically mm. grouped under, and it really sort of encompasses a fear of uh, things that replicate living people. Mm. So, you know, within that phobia, I mean, there are people who are afraid of, of uh, very specific types of dolls, whether it's a porcelain doll or, or whatnot, or talking dolls or, or ventriloquist dolls. Then there are people who are afraid of mannequins, um, androids. You know, there's this whole range of this, this phobia and it's really it's it's something <clears throat> that i think we're going to see play a larger part in society in the coming years and here's why uh, there's a concept i delve into in the book called the uncanny valley hmm. and the concept of the uncanny valley uh in in very uh in very short terms is that once something is created to replicate a living being, uh, there's this strange territory it enters because uh, what happens is, as humans, when we interact with something that is alive, whether it's another person or a, a child or a baby or you know a, a pet or a squirrel in the park, whatever it is, there are certain dynamics that occur. Uh, we see the eye movement. We see some type of, of body language or responses. Uh, if, if it's a, a person, we, we might get verbal responses. And all of these things, they register in a certain part of human consciousness has, uh, quote, acceptable because, hey, we're interacting with something that's living. Well, Paul, what happens when something is interacting with us, but our logical mind says this thing is not alive mm. it should not be doing this you know it, it we get this dynamic where okay we've got a simple doll that doesn't do anything advance that now we've got a doll whose eyes open and close and its head turns then we've got dolls that that talk that say phrases mm. it's gotten more and more advanced mm. and has it has advanced People have become more and more unnerved and uncomfortable, a certain certain number of people. And I think that it's going to be a big thing within our society in the coming years because of the development of robots or androids. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you look now at what scientists in Japan are doing, uh, they are – essentially replicating humans i mean it's mm. it's it's science fiction that you know when you and i were kids you'd, you'd look at it on television and say this is incredible but yeah. we're, we're seeing this we're seeing this come to life and you know there are synthetic you know humans now that will respond to certain comments they'll they'll have a dialogue with you well, what does that do to the human brain because you know, we have to reconcile how is this happening? This is not a living being. Something is wrong. And for a lot of people, that delves into that territory where all the alarm bells go off and, you know, there's there's a great level of discomfort with people trying to reconcile what they're experiencing. And, man, when you throw in the potential or the reality of some dolls being haunted – by something otherworldly, uh, that, of course, takes it to a whole different level. And uh, I don't know if I answered your question there, but it, it kind of <laughs> it kind of led into that quite well. And, you know, I, I think this is one of the major points uh, of this work that I've done is trying to get through to people to understand there's there's a lot more going on here, even on a psychological and emotional level, uh, than just a matter of, hey, here's a doll. It might have a ghost in it. 
Yes. Yeah. Very true. I think uh, I think people were obviously used to be terrified about uh, robots and 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 androids adapting their AI and 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 obviously we saw a famous incident of of the Facebook program that after a couple of days decided to, to create its own language. Oh right, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and was quickly shut down, or so they tell us. Anyway, <laughs> and, and <laughs> right. that's something that's always been you know it's a mainstay of science fiction through. Um, do androids dream of electric sheep to silent running and and obviously terminator terminator 2001 yes. these all have the the robots sort of reclaiming the earth because they they view humans as a as a as a problem rather than than a creator so it's interesting like you say that it whereas this kind of developing fear in regards to dolls in their very varied guises seems to cause a, a, a more emotional reaction to the people that claim to have had incidents or, or just generally find them weird. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously the, the book is, is firstly a, a fantastic history of, of the culture and uh, development of dolls throughout civilization, which I think is quite a strikingly interesting point to the book, David, is that Throughout the world, regardless of culture, time scale, whatever, we, we can trace the use of dolls in a variety of ways across continents and, and centuries. And it's I found that very peculiar that certain civilizations seem to develop the doll around the same time for a lot of them, you know, and, and that's carried on into the modern era. Yeah, very much so. Uh, you see, of course, cultural differences and you know, I think that a lot of people don't, uh, unless they're really fascinated by dolls and do their research, a lot of people don't realize some interesting points about dolls. One is that uh, how far back in history they can be traced. Uh, you know, they've been found at archaeological sites and, and just, you know, there's a whole fascinating history, part of the history there. But one of the other things about dolls is that they were not originally made as toys. Mm-hmm. Most people don't realize this because, you know, in our modern society, when you when you think of dolls, you think, oh, you know, they're made for little girls to play with. Well, no, uh, <laughs> you know, originally, <laughs> probably the most widespread use of dolls originally was for magic and or ritual. Uh, now, there were some cases where cultures would use dolls as teaching tools mm-hmm. and use it to uh, use the dolls or the figures to you know, act out certain uh, cultural tales and things like that to pass the knowledge on. But what you'll find all over the world is various magical processes using dolls, some type of doll. And, of course, the most famous one we have today is the idea of the voodoo doll. Uh, But really, it goes, you know, much deeper than that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably the most well-known of the interpretation of using a doll as, as a kind of embodiment of, of evil or revenge. Um, I think most people, if you ask them, they would, you know, they would all describe the, the voodoo doll with the sticking of pins in it. So as a cultural thing, that's probably the most renowned and, and well-known in the modern era, David, isn't it? Yeah, it is, it is absolutely. But, you know, uh, the use of that type of a doll, first of all, what we're talking about here is essentially what's called sympathetic magic. Mm. And it's the principle that if I have something that uh, represents, you know, a person I don't like, I can do things to that representation that will in turn have the same effect on, on the target. Mm. And uh, in, in, in very simple terms, that's what we're talking about here. Now, this technique goes back, it goes very far back in Europe uh, where they would utilize what's called a poppet, mm. uh, sometimes made of cloth, or they would use, uh, sometimes they would use wax figures. There are a whole range of different things that they would utilize mm. as a uh, as a focal point for their magical ceremony. And usually, just like we, we hear in voodoo doll stories, uh, what they would do is try to find a, a personal item, some kind of connection to that target, whether it was a hair clipping or a piece of their clothing, something that would, uh, in in effect, energetically tie 
the victim to the the uh, the doll itself that was being used in the ritual. So that's how the effect was uh, purportedly carried out on the target. And it's interesting because you know voodoo dolls. Uh, a lot of people assume, oh, you know, the voodoo doll came from Africa. You know, it's this whole well, not exactly. The you know the origins of the voodoo doll are pretty pretty gray in a lot of ways and uh we have to go back to old new orleans and look at the melting pot that was uh you know early america so we had all these influences from uh the slaves that were brought here during the slavery period uh we had european influence from you know the french the spanish the the english and there's all of these various traditions just sort of melding together and somewhere along the way, uh, what essentially is is sort of a stylized European poppet began to be used in in modern voodoo ritual. Has oh, this is a voodoo doll, you know? It's, uh, we make it out of cloth and, and we fill it with their hair and we stick pins in it. So uh, that's that's kind of the evolution of those. Uh, truthfully, a whole book could be written just on on that topic. It's pretty fascinating, but uh, yeah, obviously it's it's covered in the book. Yeah, very much so. And it's it's interesting as well, because obviously these days, or well, not so much in, in, in England, in, in the British Isles, the term poppet has become to, to symbolise uh, something that you believe to be cute. Right. Which, which I find a really interesting uh, switch, because that's <laughs> not what they were 300 years ago. Well, and at the same time, we have to, you know, I have to put this in. Um, <clears throat> typically, we view that kind of sympathetic magic has all uh, sort of black magic, right? It's, oh, it's it's for revenge, it's for this or that. Well, a lot of times those types of uh, poppets or dolls would be utilized uh, for what the person viewed as positive things. Uh, love spells were very common. Mm-hmm. You know, they would try to uh, get someone to fall in love with them by, by using a poppet. It's still manipulation, so it, it's still a... A negative type of expression but uh, there are other uses of these dolls where you know a, a representation of a person would be made and rituals would be done to try to help them be uh, healthy or have abundance and and things like that so just like in most areas of magic we find there's a whole range of how these things can be used in ceremony and and ritual and of course you know the the media uh, immediately latches on to the most sinister and the most dramatic aspects of these things. So <laughs> hence we get the, you know, the voodoo doll and, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the image of all the pins sticking out of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Many a, 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 a romantic comedy has often used uh, the, the purposes of the voodoo doll practice as, as some kind of plot device often as well. Uh, yes. David. It's, it's <laughs> also, also terms is that, uh, Apparently, it's really easy to pluck hairs out of people, apparently, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't think it works like that. But anyway, so, I mean, clearly, I think for most people, there are probably two very famous haunted dolls in the modern era. But I don't want to start with either of those two, if that's all right, <laughs> because I think sure. I, I think the wonderful thing about your book is there's a couple of them that I'd never heard of. One we've mentioned briefly earlier, um, but there's... The one whose name I think's the best in this cha- in the chapter that you do about the, the famous haunted dolls is Mandy, the cracked faced doll. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that's quite an unusual backstory as well because it's it's one of them where it just seems to have appeared with this history of alleged paranormal activity around it. Yeah, that's true. And have you I I know you've seen the picture, obviously, of yes. Mandy. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and I just saw Mandy in person last uh, last fall. Mm. Not this previous fall, but the year before. Yeah. Uh, it's in a small museum in uh, Quesnel, uh, in British Columbia, is where the doll ended up. Mm. And yeah, it's it's a very strange story. It's the doll is about a hundred years old. Uh, to clarify for listeners. The, the face of this doll is indeed cracked. It's a porcelain doll uh, that has obviously you know, seen better days. Uh, they believe it was made in Europe in uh, the early 1900s. Mm. And the strange thing that happened with this doll is that uh, it, it was 
donated to the museum by a, a woman who chose to remain anonymous. Hmm. And she marched in, you know, with this uh, antique doll and basically said, I want you to take this doll. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, she was acting very peculiar uh, yeah. about it. And, uh, you know, obviously considering all the damage and everything, they, they sort of looked the doll over. And the woman told the people at the museum that since she'd had the doll in her house, she would often wake up with the sound of a child crying in her home. She had no children in her home. Uh, additionally, she would find a, a window in her basement consistently open. Mm. So, you know, the <laughs> the museum took the doll, mm. and um, it's, it's one of these things that the stories are kind of muddled. You know, we don't really know. Uh, there's, there's a legend that the doll was found in the basement of a house. Uh, there's a legend that uh, this is all modern folklore, essentially, mm. that has built up around this doll. Because you know, we're talking about something that's less than 100 years old. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, people are talking about, well, you know, it was found in the basement of a, a home. Uh, there was a little girl murdered there. Mm. Uh, there are you know, all these different things. And in the course of the investigation of this thing, there have been uh, different things that have been captured around Manatee. There have been light anomalies. Uh, people claim they've heard voices. Uh, people say they've they've had uh, difficulty taking pictures of her. You know, it was a, a photographer that came and did a story and and had trouble with his equipment. Uh, so, you know, some really fascinating things. I mean, when we when we spent some time around Mandy, we didn't have anything anomalous occur. Uh, but it is, you know, and I, and I'm not, I don't have a phobia of dolls, uh, but this is, this is an odd looking doll just because of the damage and everything. And it's sort of, you look at it and it's sort of a, the eyes are kind of half shut. It's sort of a sleepy looking doll almost. Mm -hmm. And it just, it, it has this atmosphere that, oh, this doll's kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And is Mandy one of the dolls where you kind of have to. Uh, seek acceptance before you can sort of approach or, or talk to her or take a picture, David. Well, there's no there's no specific legends of that, no. And you know, it's um, it seems to be this is one of the dolls that seems to be very, I would say, inconsistent <laughs> with what manifests around it. You know, sometimes there are things going on, sometimes there's activity, sometimes there's not. Curiously enough, the museum uh, that the doll is in. Uh, does have some other areas of activity. And I, I've spoken to a number of people who have uh, been able to investigate that museum. And they do report there are strange things that occur just, you know, in the building itself. And, and they've, I, I do know a couple of people that have had some serious things occur with Mandy. One person that got very, very ill uh, just from being close to her. Um, so, you know, I think some of these dolls, I would say that some people are more susceptible to these hauntings than others at times. And, and I think that's one of the factors that comes in when we consider these objects. Yeah, because some of them really do tend to, for some of the, I, I use the term victims, but I'm, I'm not really sure that's, I think that's that's overcooking it somewhat. <laughs> but, but some of the people who have, who have met uh, a, a variety of these famous dolls, do seem to have a real kind of, either, you know, obviously the, there are many uh, mentions of people suffering physical ailments from, from a visit where they may have been disrespectful. But there also seems to be a lot of psych psychological trauma for people who, who perhaps may may not be strong enough to deal with whatever these embodiments are emitting. Sure, that's definitely an aspect, and that, that goes back to what we talked about uh, earlier, you know, this concept of the uncanny valley, uh, the the phobias, of course, that affect a lot of people, mm. and how they respond in the presence of these things. Yeah, yeah, very much so, because it's, it's essentially a two-pronged tack for, for, for some of these uh, dolls when they meet certain people. Um, I have to touch on, on the, my favorite doll in your book. Uh, and, and to be honest, because it's 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 quite a, a sad story. If you if you read this in a romantic 
novel, you you you'd probably have it tugging at your heartstrings, which is the delightfully named Mister Creepy. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> and I've I I found after rereading your book, David, I, I I've got a, a lot of respect for Mister Creepy. I, I I'm kind of rooting for him that he's reunited. <laughs> yeah. So Mr. Creepy is uh, hes one of your favorites, Paul. He's a ventriloquist doll. Yeah, precisely, which is what is, is, has caused me a bit of conflict over this particular situation. But, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable no with doubt. moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, Mr. Creepy. It, it is a fascinating story, and it is a sad story. Mr. Creepy is <clears throat> hes owned by a good friend of mine who uh, lives in Seattle, Ross Allison. And... Uh, Ross discovered Mr. Creepy because, uh, much like I do, Ross will, he, he travels a lot and he'll often go into antique stores and <laughs> he kind of does something similar to me. He'll, he'll start talking to the people and say, do you have anything in here that's, you know, unusual or, or strange or, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe bothers you? And, and of course he, he had this uh, incident where he walked into one of these shops and was talking to the clerk, and, and the immediate response was, Mr. Creepy. And <laughs> Ross, of course, was intrigued by, by, the, uh, <laughs> by the comment, just as I would have been, and he said, what's, you know. So this, uh, this person took him over and showed him a, a glass uh, case with this ventriloquist doll. Hmm. And Ross was told this ventriloquist doll moves uh, all over the place hmm. and, you know, really disturbs me. And, and of course, Ross purchased the doll. Uh, if you go online, of course, there are, there are photographs in my book. You can find pictures online, too, of Mr. Creepy. Uh, in some ways, he's kind of comical because you look at him and he's a – He's a ventriloquist doll who has a, a big mop of hair and sort of a big, <laughs> uh, shall I say, a, a big 70s porn stash, as they used to call it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the the wide eyes, you know, that a lot of uh, ventriloquist dolls have. However, the background story to this doll is this. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who was a professional ventriloquist and – performed for for many many years he was very talented and he was also a talented uh, carver and and uh, made ventriloquist dolls himself so in his later years uh, he made a doll in his likeness this is mr creepy now he went a couple of steps further because in deciding to make the doll in his likeness, he decided, well, what would make this even better but to use some of my own hair? So it is his human hair uh, that he utilized to make the ventriloquist doll in his likeness. Around the time he did this, he made a second doll one in the likeness of his lifelong love, his wife, uh, <laughs> that also was made utilizing her hair. Mm. Uh, the story is, is that you know, somehow these dolls ended up uh, probably sold at an estate sale or something and ended up with this antique shop. Uh, the two dolls were together on display for a long time. And uh, something happened, I can't recall right off, something happened that the antique shop had to move their location. And when they did so, of course, they, they packed everything up and just massive amounts of, of product and, and antiques that they put in storage until they secured their new location and opened back up. And when they opened back up and started putting things out, uh, they found Mr. Creepy, but they did not find Mr. Mrs. Creepy. So... From that time forward, uh, this doll would move on its own. Uh, people have uh, come in and found it. It's, it's on display at Ross's uh, Spooked in Seattle. Uh, he has a he runs a ghost tour, and he also has a, a museum area that you can go in, and you can see Mister Creepy, who sits in a glass case. And both Ross and people that that work 
at Spooked have had some strange incidents around this figure. Uh, Ross caught a, a very amazing photograph of uh, the doll sort of leaning against the glass, and, and there's a reflection, you know, that is from somewhere else of what looks like a another face, another Mr. Creepy type of face. And the belief is is that the doll is looking for its companion. So, you know, they'll come in and find its head turned in different directions uh, to be found leaning against the gra- glass, you know, when there's really no reason that it should have moved. Nothing else in the case has moved. And, uh, you know, it, it's it, it's something that uh, there's been a lot of activity around this doll. And, uh, you know, I, I keep telling Ross he should maybe put an ad out that said, you know, Mr. Creepy six, Mrs. Creepy to see if anyone is, <laughs> is, but he's concerned, you know, that he would get the wrong kind of responses. Maybe that's a concern. I don't know, but <laughs> yes, yeah, very true. But very you know, uh, it, it's, yeah. So it's a, it's a fascinating story. It's kind of a sad story. And uh, I think uh, like you, I think we're all rooting for at some point, uh, Mrs. Creepy turning up. I mean, we might all be pulling for the wrong thing and getting them together could be the worst thing for everybody, David. But to create chaos like yeah. the end of Ghostbusters. We just don't... <laughs> Very true, but I'm, I'm an old, soft romantic at heart. And the, the, this, I, I, it's very odd. There's, there was, it's, there's a real emotional um, response to this story, I think, when you read it, especially because you discover that, you know, this was the representation of a, of, of a loving couple um, with the addition yeah. of them using their own hair for these yeah. dolls, which kind of then once again connects us back to that kind of love potion spell and using hair to kind of bind a, a spell or a spirit to a to an object. Um, so there's there's clearly a bit of old fashioned superstition attached to perhaps the reason they created them in the first place. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know, as you're stating, we get uh, this this story in particular is fascinating because we do get all these conflicting elements, you know, for people who are unnerved or disturbed by dolls, uh, he'll do it. You know, (laughs) you just take a look at him. And, uh, and then of course he's a ventriloquist doll. So you have the moving, uh, you know, the moving features and, (laughs) you know, then there's sort of the old kind of 70 style look that, that he has, which is sometimes comical and sometimes for other people a bit unsettling in and of itself. And then, you know, it, it's interesting to see people meeting Mr. Creepy for the first time. And when you when you throw the fact on them that, oh, by the way, this is human hair. <laughs> responses that, you know, I, I've seen people just sort of turn pale and, <laughs> and have a hard time uh, wrapping their minds around that fact. But, yeah, that's uh, that's yet another element. And as you stated, it, it creates this sort of um, energetic binding to you know, someone that is, is long past, but maybe in some way is still here. Yeah, absolutely. As if they could carry on their love from the other side, I, I suspect, David. Absolutely. Oh, and good on them. Let's, let's, let's make that our big paranormal drive for next year. 2020, let's get the creepies back together, I think. <laughs> we could all pull together in the Fortean field, David, and see what happens. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know if enough people are out there looking. Well, the, I mean, as you touch on, um, haunted dolls have also essentially become big business, haven't they? Um, and there's a, a very interesting story. I'm, I'm trying to be balanced about it because having read your book, I, I think I know which side of the fence I fall on in this one. Uh, and that's the story of uh, Harold the doll, um, who seems to be one of these that, that's turned up with a backstory and been sold. Yeah, Harold is is fascinating just because it's um, yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying just trying to think to where where to start with Harold. So Harold initially surfaced uh, as a quote haunted doll and uh, made a lot of um, got a lot of attention, if you will. He was he was featured on an episode of Ghost Adventures. Uh, he was. You know, pretty notorious for a time there and, and, you know, purportedly was a very dangerous doll that was causing deaths. And then the other shoe kind of dropped and it was revealed that the original story was fabricated. Mm. Um, but 
you know, this is this is one of those things, Paul. This, Harold really fascinates me because mm-hmm. it's sort of watching folklore come to life in front of our eyes and to a degree. And, you know, it also kind of reels in the concept that how much do we as humans create, create or co-create these hauntings? Uh, because the story with Harold is that, you know, all of these events transpired. Uh, then this monkey wrench is thrown in when someone says, oh, by the way, this is all, uh, you know, this, that was fabricated. That that didn't happen. Uh, but then you've got documented incidents around this doll that can that do continue to occur. Mm-hmm. A- and it seems as if, uh, you know, we're left with this strange puzzle where we have to say, OK, either Harold was always haunted even though part of the story was fabricated Mm -hmm. or Harold was not initially haunted, but because so many people believe that he is, he is now. Mm. (laughs) So it's, it's a quite, it's quite a fascinating story. The man who owns him now, uh, Anthony Quinata is, um, you know, has documented, he's written a whole book on Harold Mm -hmm. and documents a lot of the stuff that transpired with the doll and still does. And, uh, Anthony says, you know, that the there's so many things that he's documented. And I've talked to other people who have documented very strange events around this doll. So it does seem that something, something is occurring around this doll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Harold doesn't seem to be very keen on psychics either, does he? No. <laughs> I think I think out of all the the dolls, he's he's the one probably with the pottiest mouth. I would suspect. It seems so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he he seems to take um, real umbrage if if we are to to believe, but it's it's more than one person that's claimed this in these kind of interactions with with Harold at at the invitation of his current owner. Um, that they they all seem to have had very negative and personal experiences with it when they've sort of tried to probe it. Yeah. And there's, there's other people, you know, that have simply tried to investigate Harold, uh, because, you know, these legends of, of people, um, you know, dire illnesses and and death and so forth around this doll. But there are other people that have, uh, just investigated or been around the doll and have come away with ill effects. So, you know, again, we have to consider is that, you know, what exactly is going on there? Is that something psychological? Uh, what What's the dynamic that's occurring? Uh, it, it would be, you know, Harold's one of those things that would be really curious to me to sort of do some experiments with. And, uh, for instance, introducing him or introducing someone to him who had no idea who he was, mm. you know, or anything about the background story, you know. So there's not that um, – so they're not predisposed to, oh, this is a very sinister doll. And, and what does it put off? Uh, I, I'd like to, I kind of like to see that, that done just to see how those people respond. And if there are effects, uh, you know, that people independently experience without knowing the background story. Absolutely. I think, I think with anything, when it comes to the paranormal and Fortean, David, we should always try you know, to achieve a litmus test with, you know, either complete skeptics or people who have no idea about the phenomenon that you want them to kind of, give you a gauge on and i think it 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 can be sometimes interesting as you say there has uh harold's reputation manifested itself due to the modern interpretation of 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 his original story or is it like you say was he was he always a nasty piece of work according to these people and he's he just wasn't picked up properly well sure and then you know we could almost bring this full circle paul and say well you know, there's the age-old idea that you can imbue a doll with energy, mm-hmm. uh, just like you would do in a ceremony or a magical ritual. So what has happened now over the years that people have met Harold or even just looked at pictures of him and thought about him and thought about, that's an evil doll. You know, because we really, basically, we, we only have a basic knowledge of the human energy field at this point. There's so much more we need to learn. Mm-hmm. And, you know, ancient cultures, ancient traditions have long talked about what humans are capable of, uh, you know, 
on a, on an energetic level. And I know for some people that sounds like I'm getting into, Oh, he's getting all new age or, you know, Mm -hmm. no, this is, we're talking about very uh, simple concepts. You know, the, the quantum sciences are, are looking at these things, you know, scientists in the last 10 to 15 years are looking more and more at the human energy field and saying, what is it, you know, what gets, what are we able to project? Mm -hmm. And if you start considering that, In terms of some of these objects, well, what have we, like I said earlier, what have we co-created? I think it's one of those things as well that throughout folklore and mythology, David, there's always been an innate belief in the ability to give life to inanimate objects, be it from um, the Jewish faith with the golem, uh, you know, Greek mythology, bringing the dead back to life, same in Roman, Egyptian. There's always been that kind of control over Im- imbibing life of something that shouldn't be there either for good or nefarious reasons david oh absolutely and that those concepts can be found all over the world and i mean re- really you know we could i mean this is off topic for today but we could mm. really even go down the other route and talk about the concept of tulpas mm. uh, is something I, i've delved into quite extensively and you know that is that is essentially creating something from just a, a bare thought yes and it goes through a uh, you know a whole evolution but uh, I, I think that you know within the spectrum of the paranormal one of the things that is often not considered is the human factor the human interaction you know what is occurring uh, you know what, what's occurring when one person goes in to investigate a purportedly haunted location. What's occurring when, when five people or ten people go in together? Each each thing changes the, the dynamic because you have to consider each of those individuals, how they interact with each other, how they respond to each other, to the environment, and, and so on and so forth. It's very complex, and it's something that is is not often – paid much attention to because, you know, people sort of go in and, you know, they have a very set mind, uh, you know, that, oh, I'm going to go in and I'm going to check EMF readings or, or you know, get uh, get EVPs or, or whatever. And, uh, you know, I always say, let's look at this very holistically and understand exactly what dynamics are going on. Yeah, absolutely, because I think it, it spreads out into, into wider portions as well david because obviously you've got you know probably the most common experience for people of that is your gut feeling and and gut feelings make no sense at all scientifically because why is you why is you why do you get that feeling in your stomach it's it doesn't seem to have any kind of rational response right and we could consider that an energetic response on some level because we're, and, and I use that term because we're responding to something that we don't consciously understand what's causing this reaction. And and so many people use that. You know, Paul, there's the whole in, – in America, there's a whole concept of what's called the blue sense. Hmm. And this is uh, this is a phrase that's used by law enforcement. Uh, and I, I've, I've had a lot of friends in law enforcement over the years, and, you know, they – a lot, an amazing number of law enforcement officers have incredible stories. Mm. Uh, you know, it's not always consistent, but there are these moments when they have this extra sensory experience, you know, where they just know there's there's something, something that they can't quite define that tells them, no, I can't go through this door. No, I need to go in this direction. You know, something that occurs mm. – that seems extraordinary in the aftermath, but in the moment they follow that gut feeling, as you call it, mm-hmm. and it works out for the best. Yeah. So, I mean, what is it? What's yeah. what's causing that react? You know, what's where do they get that information from? Yeah, it's it's almost as if the environment seems to be charged differently. I think if you speak to anybody, uh, coincidentally, David, who's worked in the entertainment industry or, or you know working as a uh, as a waiter or a waitress or a bartender or or even a bouncer, they will all tell you, and I speak from previous experience of my younger years, there are certain occasions when you can just feel that it's going to be one of those nights. There's something oh, yes. about it that it just doesn't feel right. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's as though things are slightly out of kilter. Yes, absolutely. 
Yeah, very much so. Well, I think that's a good way to kind of point us towards our two most notorious dolls. <laughs> um, uh, one of whom I think really does deserve his own film, but I suspect people don't want... It may be a, a subject nobody wants to touch, so I'll, I'll start with the one that's, that's made the transfer to, to uh, the cinema, which is obviously the infamous Annabelle. Um, but Annabelle's quite striking because the, the cinema version... <laughs> bears no resemblance to the real the real one no there's not <laughs> not at all uh and it's funny you know of course the annabelle films have been wildly wildly successful mm. um there are people who don't even realize that you know the story came from a a quote paranormal case mm -hmm. uh but uh annabelle the original doll was a or is a Raggedy Ann doll. Mm. Now, to some degree, I can kind of understand the filmmakers <laughs> because, you know, I, I think if you were going to pick any kind of doll that looks non-threatening, <laughs> it's, prob <laughs> it's probably the Raggedy Ann doll. You know, this mm -hmm. is just basically a floppy, you know, cloth doll with, with a smile and bright, you know, stringy hair. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, what what they did in the film was they went the route of the sort of classical porcelain looking doll, mm. you know, that's, that's uh, unsettling for a lot of people, <laughs> but the original doll was uh, the story came from a case investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now the, the Warrens are pretty well known. Obviously uh, they're, they're the basis of the Conjuring franchise that's been coming out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were some of the modern era's, you know, first uh, celebrity ghost hunters, if you will. I, I guess is probably the, the way to talk about them. They they started uh, investigating cases very actively in the 70s. I, I can remember when I was a kid, you know, I, I saw the Warrens lecture early on. Uh, they were kind of making a name for themselves even back then and, and were uh, traveling about. Ed's approach was very uh, Catholic-based, uh, delved into the demonology aspects. Lorraine, uh, Lorraine, who we lost uh, this year, mm -hmm. she she was a uh, psychic and would do readings on the cases. And the story about Annabelle is that they got a call uh, from a young woman who had this doll and it was, it was creating all these problems in her apartment. She said that the doll had, uh, it was moving around on its own, uh, was, you know, reportedly attacking people, uh, just really kind of creeping everyone out. And, uh, they would, they would find, they would find notes that had been written purportedly, by Annabelle on these pieces of parchment, uh, which further disturbed them, of course. So finally, they end up with um, Ed and Lorraine coming and taking the doll away. And even when the Warrens take the doll away, um, you know, there's an incident where they're driving away with the doll in the back seat, and, and Ed almost loses control of the car. So the, all these stories that surround this doll, it, it ended up in the Warrens Museum. Uh, it, it was a very famous picture. It's easy to find online of this case mm. that was built to house this doll uh, with a you know warning sign and do do not open and uh, a little glass window to look in at this raggedy hand doll. And, and it's sort of it, it's strange and sort of absurd in some ways. And then you hear the backstory and you hear that uh, you know this doll is is considered highly dangerous by these veteran investigators. Uh, it's it's currently it's still it's under the care of Tony Spera, yeah, and uh, who inherited the uh, the doll itself, and of course it's become a, a household name due to the movies of recent years, and uh, it's probably might be the most famous haunted doll currently. Yeah. You know, everybody knows who Annabelle is at this point. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Tony's was Tony um, the Warren's son-in-law. Yes. Yeah, because I think that's yeah. Now, obviously, I think not along with the films is it 
you, you touch on this incident because when I decided to sort of return to the to the 14 subject, this incident happened towards the back end of 2017, I think, where Annabelle famously appeared on on Ghost Adventures, or rather yes. inf- infamously due to <laughs> infamously. due to what occurred. Now, what what's your feelings about that, David? Because that seems to be a no win situation for everybody involved in it. I think. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, the story is, of course, Annabelle, who rarely is taken out of the the secure case. Um, Tony agreed to bring Annabelle to to take Annabelle to Las Vegas, Nevada, for an episode of Ghost Adventures, and um, he carried the doll to uh, Zach's museum in Vegas, where an investigation was done that included Annabelle. And it was uh, it kind of it was kind of dramatic as it unfolded because during the course of the investigation, uh, Tony had set down some very strong parameters, and one of the things was he insisted that no one touch the doll. He he carried it in this uh, this very specially designed box, and he would only take it out with with gloves himself, and and you know put it up where it was going to be investigated and during the course of the investigation uh zach touched the doll which upset tony greatly Mm -hmm. and caused him to to take the doll and leave uh, the museum so uh those two have kind of you know they they reconciled the situation i I don't think that um you know i I won't speak to their personal opinions on i I have spoke Mm -hmm. spoken to zach about the situation uh when I was working on the book and uh, you know, there's, there were some strange things that manifested around the doll during the course of the investigation there. They were using an SLS camera, which is the connect mm-hmm. uh, camera that detects the stick figures. You know, uh, when something is trying to manifest, they had readings yeah. from that. They had numerous other manifestations occurring. And, you know, all of those guys say, no, there's something, there's something about that doll. It's something very unsettling. There's something, you know, disturbing. There's something attached to it. Uh, this is what these guys believe. And once again, you know, we have a situation similar to Harold, where we just don't really know. I mean, it's hard to go back now, and, and obviously, we can't go back and reinvestigate the original incident because hmm. you know that's long past. It's hard to to find the origins. You know, where did Annabelle come from exactly? Was there something that occurred prior to the young woman who received her? And, you know, all we have to go on is, at this point, uh, decades of people believing that this is a highly charged evil doll. Mm. And that alone, perhaps, has charged the object enough so that it is indeed something uh, troublesome. Yeah. I think that's there seems to be a consistent thing with this, David. That for a lot of these dolls, it's it's very hard to unpick fact from fiction, especially over the last sort of twenty years, as these items have become more popular and and more discussed. Would you say that's more of a frustration than anything? Because that we, we tend to to lose some of these origin stories are quite um, nondescript, really. Obviously, I know Mister Creepies is, is is quite a strange, but nice story whereas like you say annabelle's story seems to be is is it fact or is it is it myth now right right or is it both yeah you know and and uh <laughs> you know uh, again what are we seeing what kind of story are we seeing be created uh it it is kind of frustrating it's also for me you know it's understandable to a degree because we're talking about uh, some of these dolls you know, under under a lot of circumstances, it would be very difficult to trace their their origins and to define, you know, to understand exactly uh, why is this thing, you know, uh, why are strange things happening around this doll? I know that I've seen a lot. I've seen an awful lot of haunted dolls, and uh, they <laughs> surface constantly. Of course, there's there's you know there's a whole market now for these haunted dolls. Uh, you go on eBay and you type that in, you'll get so many results. It's, it's mind-boggling. And really, how do you 
how do you trace down, you know, how do you vet those stories? Uh, well, it's a fascinating story, but, you know, where did it come from originally? It, it's kind of difficult. I mean, you know, Paul, you could walk into a, into a thrift store and probably buy half a dozen creepy dolls. Mm. And for all intent and purposes, that moment of you purchasing that thing and having some kind of experience, that's the starting point of the story because who knows where it came from before that? You know, it, it it could have been, you know, it could have been some little girl's play toy for 20 years or likewise, it could have been something that was being used in, you know, in San Francisco in satanic rituals. I mean, we, just, <laughs> you know, we really we don't know. So it, it creates this hazy area of, of uh, history around some of these objects that in some ways make them frustrating and in other ways make them all the more intriguing. And I think a prime example of that is is probably the last celebrity doll I want to touch on, David, um, which is Robert, who is out of all the dolls seems to be the most sensible because he's moved to Florida. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so clearly, clearly Robert likes the, the the good weather most of the year. So fair play to him. And and also the the obviously his his attire would tend to put him. You know, he had to be a, on a coastal state with the, at the very least, David. So. <laughs> But Robert's one of those stories where there's the the myth, and but we've actually been able to unpick it and, and find the kernel of truth about his origins and, and what happened there. Yeah, Rob, Robert is probably my favorite. Uh, he's I call him the grandfather of haunted dolls because mm. really he's he, he's the guy. <laughs> he's he's the one. Uh, Robert the doll. Uh, you made a comment earlier about movies based on Robert, and actually, a lot of people don't realize this, but there there have been a couple of movies made about Robert specifically. They were very low budget, <laughs> not very well done, unfortunately. Uh, but the uh, the word is that he was also the inspiration for probably the other most famous movie doll, and that is Chucky. Uh, so, you know, we, we have those things to kind of throw into the Robert story. But the the tale of Robert, originally, I remember hearing this when I was very young and interested in, in these things. So the original story that passed around for years was that Robert the doll was handmade by a uh, a, a servant woman who worked in the auto household who, depending on the version you listen to, she was either fired or she became angered by something that had transpired and she decided to curse the family. So using some form of voodoo, she made this doll uh, and gave it a certain degree of life and, and gave it as a, quote, gift to the little boy in the family, uh, Robert Eugene Otto. And after that, all kinds of chaos and trouble broke out in the household. So over the years, you know, people dug into the story and it, and it turned out that the whole thing about the voodoo curse and, and the magic used on the doll and so forth was all folklore. And uh, it still stands as part of the whole uh, tapestry that, that makes up the, the Robert story. But we know that, no, this is not the case. In fact, uh, there's a gentleman in Key West where Robert lives currently named David Sloan, who has done a lot of work on Robert and his origins. And uh, they eventually traced down, they were able to find the, uh, some of the original origins of, of Robert. It turned out that he came from Europe and that he was made as a, a display, uh, a doll for a display window. So it sort of gave him some unique aspects. Uh, it's believed that the clothing he wears, which is a sailor's suit, uh, was probably clothing that belonged to Eugene Otto, the little boy who, who had the doll. And uh, that he, he gave Robert his own clothes. Now, for those who don't know the story of Robert, uh, he, he was indeed given to this little boy. The little boy's name was Robert Eugene Otto. And when he received this doll, he dubbed the doll Robert. He gave Robert his own name. Mm -hmm. 
And from that point forward, uh, the little boy wasn't called Robert anymore. The little boy was called Eugene. And the doll was called Robert. And indeed, strange things did begin to occur in the Eugene household or in the Aldo household. Uh, so these things would happen that, you know, at a, at a base level, it sounds like, oh, this has got to be a, a kid up to some mischief. So, you know, plates would, would be thrown on the floor and smashed. And when the parents rushed in, uh, Eugene would say, Robert did it. Wasn't me. Robert did it. Mm-hmm. Other things, other incidents begin to occur. And consistently, the little boy would say, Robert did it. Now, if this is not unusual enough, <laughs> uh, has, has Eugene got older? Uh, has, has, you know, everyone does. He ended up, he went to school. He, he went away uh, to Europe and he left all his things in the auto household, uh, including Robert. And uh, Eugene ended up, uh, he got married. And when his, I believe it was his mother that became ill, uh, Eugene and his new wife uh, moved back to Key West, back into the auto household to help take care of, of his mother, who obviously she eventually passed away um, in fairly short order, actually. And Eugene and his new wife um, continued on in, in the auto household in Key West. Now, that all sounds fine on the surface, but the odd thing is, is that when they moved back to Key West, Eugene took up his old friendship with Robert the doll. He gave Robert his own room upstairs mm-hmm. in the uh, in the attic. He had furniture built for Robert that was just his size. And Robert would frequently sit in a rocking chair in front of the window looking down on the street. Now, other stories begin to grow up around this time because school kids passing by that window Go figure, they got really creeped out because they said that every time they walked by going or, or coming from school, there'd be this doll in the window staring down at them. And it just proved to be unnerving. A, a lot of the kids said that the doll would be standing at the window watching them. So much so that a lot of these kids, uh, would you believe, they began to take a different route back and forth to school just so they didn't have to walk by the household and and have the creepy doll watching them. But then other people reported strange things. They reported hearing uh, little footsteps running around upstairs when they were visiting in the auto household. Different sounds would, would come from the home that just didn't seem to make any sense because there was no one else there. Eventually... After Eugene passed away, uh, his wife, I think, couldn't get rid of the doll fast enough. <laughs> uh, the, the doll ended up being donated to a museum. And I'm giving you the short version of the Robert story. Yeah. There's much more to it. But uh, essentially, uh, Robert ended up in the care of the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West. And he's in a display case glass display case there in the museum. And there's other legends that grew up about uh, around Robert. One is that you better respect Robert or he'll curse you. Part of that respect is that uh, you should act nice when you're around him, not, not make fun of him, of him or make jokes. And that if you want to take his picture, you better ask permission first. Or things may get very bad for you. Now, we can look at this and say, oh, okay, well, this is more crazy folklore. However, if you go and visit Robert at the museum, you'll see a display there behind him of a, a large board covered with letters. Now, these letters are changed out on occasion because 
You see, the museum constantly receives letters from people who have come to the museum. They saw Robert, and they made the mistake of making fun of him, making jokes, or taking his picture without asking permission. And in the aftermath, they experienced terrible misfortunes. These letters, they're addressed to Robert. And they say things like, uh, Dear Robert, please, please forgive me for making fun of you. I'm so sorry. Uh, can you please remove the curse? Uh, these letters will tell the tales of, of making fun of Robert, leaving the museum, getting in a car accident, or or uh, suddenly losing their job, or losing their wallet, losing their airplane tickets, having their boyfriend uh, suddenly leave them. It, the list goes on and on and on mm -hmm. of people who have experienced misfortunes just because they made fun of Robert the dog. Mm. He's he's quite weird as well in, in regards because... Be careful, Paul! Oh. <laughs> I, don't mean, I don't mean he... It, Essentially, the story is, yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, and I'll sleep well tonight. Brilliant. So, <laughs> is the fact that his his life story is extremely odd, to say the least, because there's clearly some deep-seated psychological situation there that caused Eugene to essentially create a best friend for him as a child and then to rekindle that relationship on returning home as an adult is is extremely oh. unusual <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yeah and it's you know all of the psychological aspects aside uh, i mean you're talking uh a long period now because this was see it was uh the early 1900s essentially mm -hmm. and you know so we we've, we've got a doll with a very long history at this point and again, a lot of years, a lot of stories, and you throw in just a few of the, the other aspects like the strange psychology that, that it did uh, take for, you know, Eugene to develop this relationship. It really is a relationship that he developed with the doll. And in his mind, clearly, this was a, a living, sentient being. Yeah. I think the thing that made me laugh most about people's responses to Robert is is the fact that he gets gifts sent to him, including right. <laughs> including a lot of joints, which which I found <laughs> a very weird take on on Robert's mythos that people seem to think that what that doll needs is is to get stoned. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I do like yeah, the dis I think... disclaimer that you say the staff don't <laughs> don't help themselves to any of his treats. <laughs> Yeah, it, it may, you know, maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's people hoping that he'll calm down and, and uncurse them or something, you know, uh, <laughs> after hearing the stories. But yeah, it's uh, candy, candy and, and joints are two of the biggest things that are sent to him for some reason. Uh, but there's, you know, it's, it's funny, there's another story about Robert and I'll, I'll throw this one in there too. There's an incident that occurred at this museum wherein uh, one night, the you know everything closed down the staff closed the museum up and the next day when they came in to open uh, they were doing their rounds and they discovered that uh, Robert was not alone in his case uh, in the case with him sitting on his lap was a, a small stuffed lion and they were initially quite mystified at this trying to figure out you know what how did this occur during hours the museum was closed. Uh, they eventually discovered that the the stuffed animal had come from another display in the museum. And, of course, the implication is, is that Robert had had enough of being alone in that case and went to get himself a, a friend or a little pet or, or whatever. So <laughs> sometime during the night, somehow this animal, the stuffed animal, ended up in the case with Robert and uh the the staff all pretty much unanimously said, I'm not taking it out. <laughs> yeah. He wants it, he can keep it. <laughs> so uh to this day you see you see him uh he still has that stuffed lion with him. Yeah. I mean there's a lot of these these doll stories, David, that you cover where they all seem some of them seem to be quite annoyed about being alone. And I think 
Robert, bless him. I mean, he, how long has he been in this case? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head what year they... He's been he's been in the museum quite a few years at this yeah. point. Yeah, no been wonder he quite. wants some company. I, you know, I don't blame him, David. Nobody <laughs> likes being in solitary confinement, whether you're a person <laughs> or a doll. So, um, well, if, if that's what makes him happy, then good luck to them both, <laughs> I think. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So the last aspect of this I'll, I'll touch on, David, before we, we cover y- your upcoming... 2020 and what you've got planned is there's a brilliant chapter all about creepy dolls in films and and obviously we've mentioned a couple of them uh, chucky being probably one of the most famous but you you mentioned a couple of my favorite films um one is i is one of those films that i i don't think anybody else has seen but clearly i think you had uh, which is uh, devil doll which is the very weird story about a ventriloquist and his Special doll Hugo. Oh yes, Ugh. yes, that's from uh, that's an old film. That's from uh, nineteen um, sixty four. I want to say. Yeah, I think so. It's mid sixties, yeah. I think, isn't it? Yeah, and and of course, uh, I, I'm sure you quite enjoyed it because of it. It's the ventriloquist doll, as you said. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look. Thankfully, I saw that after I'd seen Magic. So. <laughs> And, and he's really creepy as well, because essentially it's a man in a really odd costume, which it, makes it, it look even yeah. weirder. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, you know, given the time period it was made, um, mm. you know, the, the effects weren't quite the same. Yeah. So, you know, we had, we, yeah, we did have this very, you know, the, the effects are very bizarre. And it, it's, it's been a couple of years since I watched that movie, but it is kind of still unsettling, mm. you know, and uh, it, it does have those elements. I mean, just like magic that you mentioned earlier i mean i remember seeing magic back you know uh it came out in the that one came out in the 70s yeah. and that one even today i think still stands up quite well just because it, it's such a, a strange psychological uh thriller mm. you know with this with the use of this ventriloquist doll and uh i won't give away the plot lines for people who want to want to see these you know because they really are just uh, amazing pieces to watch uh, and of course you know, one of the ones uh, prior to that wasn't a film, but an episode of The Twilight Zone. Yeah. With Telly Savalas. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> you know, my my name is Talkie Tina, and I don't like you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's a really creepy uh, depiction of, of here's a doll that uh, decides it doesn't like someone mm-hmm. and is going to do whatever it can to get at this person. And, and it's, uh, again, a lot of the twilight zone episodes, they stand up quite well yeah. to time. And I, I think that one does too, you know, as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's been one of my favorite episodes along with the, uh, the legendary William Shatner terror at 30,000 feet episode with, oh, the, yes. <laughs> with the monster on the wing. Goodness me. That still yeah. frightens me as a, as a grown man. <laughs> yeah. Never that the way it's looking through. Oh, and he's going mad. Brilliant. It's one of my favorite ever <laughs> Twilight Zones. That's amazing. And obviously, it's Shatner. Brilliant. But, right. um, I mean, the other one that I've always found very interesting because it kind of crosses two paranormal genres, especially both of them have, have come to the fore, as, as we say about um, dolls, David, which is, the, which is the clown doll in Poltergeist. Oh, yes. Because that seems to be a merge of two real fears you know if you've got pediophobia and coolerophobia you're in big trouble when you come to poltergeist because there's <laughs> there's no preparing <laughs> yourself because you know what's coming oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah, I remember as a, i think i was 10 when i saw poltergeist and it's the first first film scary film i watched in the daytime that still frightened me i it, it's interesting you know i kind of i'm asked about clowns all the time and i i don't really co- co- um, cover them in the book now you know, there's, there's a, a few mentions, and of course, you know, clown dolls do come in in, in some cases. Uh, curiously, there's not really a famous haunted clown doll uh, that that has surfaced and gotten a lot of attention. I mean, there are some here and there, uh, but you know, you also branch over to this whole other phobia of people who have this fear of clowns, and you know, we have the whole, uh, you know, all the the weird business with people dressing as clowns just to terrify people or, yes. or just to stand and get their picture caught on google earth or whatever you know it's yes. it's 
It's very bizarre. And, uh, you know, that, that whole world, it, the topic does fascinate, fascinate me because I'm actually more interested in the early origins uh, and folklore of clowns, which, uh, mm. of course, have a lot to do with social commentary and everything else. And, and I think that it's sort of sad that they have been pitched in as such an object of fear in recent years. Mm. I think we're losing something. Uh, on a social level, if that makes sense to you, Paul, I, I, you know, without expounding on that, you know, extensively, uh, you know, we have to recall that the clown or the trickster figure goes far, far back in history and was always, I think, a vital component of a healthy society, uh, because of its outlet to express things. And, you know, we can say to a certain degree that, well, we still sort of have it. We have stand up comedians and they make social commentary. And so forth. But even that, to a degree, is sort of in trouble. Uh, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but, you know, I just saw a story recently where a, a comedian in Canada has been fined, I think it's $35,000 uh, for making a joke uh, about, um, and I forget, I think it was a joke about a disabled person or something. Yeah. So, you know, without getting into political commentary, we have to consider, you know, where are we going with all of this and how are we viewing the, the outlets in our society for these expressions uh, and clowns certainly come into that that spectrum absolutely I think that's that's a very interesting point because it's it's as almost as though I mean I've I've noticed it um, especially over, over you know over the last few years a couple of years ago when we, when every country in in the world seemed to be having a, a, a flap of killer clowns running everywhere even though as far as I'm aware of, nobody had actually been killed by any of these clowns. They just became killer clowns. Right. Yeah. Which, which is a strange leap of faith, <laughs> if anything. Um, right. But it's it, it's one of those things where, once again, I think people aren't sure where the change came. Because I, I know um, a lot of people tend to say it's, it's because of John Wayne Gacy. And obviously the, yes. the notoriety of the fact that he was a children's entertainer, he often dressed as a clown. However, he was also her, an horrific serial killer and preyed on young boys. But then a lot of other people would say, well, no, it's it's when Poltergeist came. But I think it's it's something that horror films have kind of, I mean, they've, they've tended to do it to a lot of, you know, we've got evil Santas and we've got you know all kinds right. of loving things that become serial killers in all horror films you know and it's weird that clowns seem to have suffered the most negatively from that kind of um horror endorsement if that makes sense david yeah well and you've got some really strong pieces out there like you mentioned uh poltergeist of course we have uh stephen king's it yes and you know both uh but the original depiction of that in in films and then the recent remake of that which you know all reinforces this idea uh, and and then, yeah, we've got, you know, just uh, I think multiple streams that have sort of fed into that. We've got the whole uh, Gacy thing who, you know, Gacy wasn't really wasn't a trained uh, clown. Uh, and if you look at particular aspects of what he was doing, for instance, uh, on, a, on a very simple level, you know, clown school, they teach. Everything needs to be rounded. You know, all the, the face paint and everything should be rounded so it's not um, scary or, you know, they have very defined ways that they make themselves mm. comical and, and, you know, comforting is, is what they're going for. Uh, but, you know, Gacy did the opposite. You, you look at pictures of Gacy dressed as a clown. Yeah. His smile is, is very pointed and sharp. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, then we get into the whole um, – other media aspects that throw that in because we've got the Joker who is a clown. Yeah. And you know, he's, he's went from originally in the comic books being just kind of ridiculous and absurd. And, and again, a certain degree, I think of, of social commentary mm -hmm. of, of, you know, just weirdness to uh, being this very sinister, dark uh, killer who just, you know, uh, slaughters wholesale. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're we're a far cry from who was it? Uh, the Caesar Romero who did this, yes. this Batman <laughs> thing in the '60s, you know, and just was this ridiculous clown, you know, Joker, and uh, mm. to what we've got today, where it's you know, you see depictions where the smile is is almost cut into his face and things. So, yeah, yeah. especially when you think about because obviously a lot of people 
will tell you that the Joker uh, that Bob Kane created was based on the Conrad Veet film. Is it the man that couldn't smile? Uh, the, yes, that's correct. Which yeah. is which is a remarkable film when you look. I think it was made in the what late twenties because I think yes. it's a silent film, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. And essentially, that's that's that typical horror love story. It's very similar to The Hunchback of Notre Dame, where some kind of uh, afflicted person tries to find love despite the ridicule of, of society around them, which when you look at his origins to what he's become, he's, he's kind of nothing. He bears no resemblance to his original incarnation at all. No, not at all. Remarkable. I, I mean, lastly, I'll mention the fact I, I was, I'm always delighted to see anybody mention Puppet Master because I think they're some of the most underrated <laughs> horror films. Pu- Puppet Master three is my favorite. It makes no sense. Um, and recently, because <laughs> it, it's wonderful, it's it's puppet mas- puppets versus the Nazis. It's it's incredible. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Toulon's Revenge, I think it's called. If you've never seen it, I recommend it highly for a for a two hour laugh. Um, and that's recently had a new film come out, which is strangely looks like they lost the script halfway through it. Um, so <laughs> I've seen the one. <laughs> it's worth it's worth a watch, but I'll I'll tell you halfway through, you think, hang on a minute. Where, what on earth has just happened? It's it's one of those films where something happens and you're like, whoa, <laughs> where are we going? But, but you're right. Yeah, you, you're right. You can't get much. Uh, you can't get much better than a bunch of you know possessed puppets killing the Nazis. So you know. <laughs> yeah, they've all got wonderful little talents as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Marvelous. So 2020, David, on the horizon. Um, sounds like it's possibly going to be another busy year for you so first what what's next for you coming out oh gosh let's see uh two books coming up the the long-awaited wood knots four I, I know i've had a lot of people message me about that cover's been up for a while and uh it's it's finally being put together those those really are a lot of work you know a lot of different contributors and and uh we want to make it a an excellent addition each time we do another volume of those so Number four is coming out uh, early in 2020. And right before that, probably right after the first of the year, uh, will be the next installment in my State Cryptids series. And this one is Monsters of the Last Frontier. I'm covering the cryptids and legends of Alaska. And uh, that one that one was a pretty... That one was kind of challenging just because uh, I've been to Alaska a lot and had a lot of material from there, but mm. there's so much. There's there's so much that occurs in that state, and I uh, really had to to sort of refine that and, and you know, cover some of these topics that for some people are, are quite confusing. The cover I released today, it's a, another beautiful piece by artist Sam Sharon, yep. and he has uh, depicted the Kushtaka. Uh, which in Alaskan lore roughly translates as the otter men or the otter people. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, you know, uh, Sam is amazing. And, and throwing this one at him, I just wasn't <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. because I, I've seen a few people try to do artistic depictions of these things. And it, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't come out very well, but man, he, he pulled this off. And uh, it's, it's another gorgeous wraparound cover that shows some of the other legends that are covered. Uh, you get a glimpse of a, a lake monster, and uh, there's a mammoth in the background because there are legends of mm. mammoths that lived much longer than people believe, yeah. and uh, some other things. So, yeah, that's uh, that one's coming out in uh, – it should be out in less than a month now. Fantastic. So early January. Yes. Fantastic. I mean, it's, it is very interesting, David, as you touched on there about mammoths. Um, it was it, it's probably as as 14 subjects go. One of those outside of Russia, I'd never really stumbled across. And then um, Adam Benedict from the Pine Barrens Institute released his book Monsters in Print. Mm-hmm. And there's three stories in there from the turn of the 19th century from Canada and Alaska about people seeing mammoths. Right. And I'd never heard of that from North America <laughs> at all, David. So when you were doing your research and pulling things together for Alaska, were you surprised by some of the, the creatures that have come forward or were you aware of most of the things you'd covered? Uh, no, pretty much all of them I, I was aware of to some degree or other. I, I had um, 
I had seen those mammoth stories years ago from early newspapers, and you know I knew there were stories. There's, there's been legends a long time, uh, primarily out of Siberia, uh, mm-hmm. parts of parts of Canada, and and a few stories from Alaska that mammoths. Uh, you know, some people were trying to imply, oh, they're they're probably still living there. Uh, I I would I would love to think that, but you know, unfortunately, I think that um, at the least, what we might be looking at is is probably a species that maybe survived a bit longer than is commonly accepted. Mm. And uh, it, it is, at the very least, a very intriguing uh, topic to explore. And, and you know, I was uh, was happy to do a section on that in the new book. Mm. I mean, it wouldn't be a massive leap of faith to, to suspect some kind of pygmy mammoth Um primarily right. existing still up there david because those areas are so remote they don't really lend themselves to archaeology so it wouldn't surprise me that we've never stumbled across them because obviously the mammoths we do know have been found all around the world right exactly and you know people often don't realize uh don't have a visual concept of how large alaska is mm. i mean it, it's a it's a massive piece of land and when you when you take in all the islands that are also part of Alaska, you're talking about an awful lot of territory. Yes, and not a lot of people. And not a lot of people. You know, a lot a lot of it's just not, uh, you know, not <laughs> not hospitable to many people, I guess. You know, although a lot of First Nations tribes that, that range across different parts of Alaska, and mm. they have found ways to survive through the years. But uh, yeah, still vast amounts of unexplored land. So uh, finally, then, just before I let you leave, you mentioned Woodnox, the fourth volume. Uh, I believe Sam's done the cover for this one as well. Yes, he has. Uh, but he's also contributed, has he not? He has. Yes, he, he's contributed a piece. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'll start releasing some of the, the information. But we've got a, a great lineup again. I mm-hmm. uh, don't want to forget anybody, but I'll name a few people right <laughs> Top of my head, so we've got uh, Chad Lewis, a good friend of mine who's, who's from the Midwest, uh, comes in with a piece on Wisconsin. Uh, Shannon Legro, who hosts Into the Fray. Yes. Uh, she's, she's on board this time. Um, a lot of new contributors this time around. This is Sam's first time writing for the publication. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've got, uh, let's see, uh, Jeff Stewart from Texas who has contributed before. He's back with another piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else do we have? We have uh, Thomas Curtin, who comes in. Um, he's a, a Ohio researcher and has written a piece on the grass man. Mm-hmm. We've got, uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, oh, uh, Ulrich Magen from uh, the Netherlands, mm-hmm. who has come in with a piece. And he's written for 40 and Times and some yes. other publications and he's done a whole survey of uh wild man and sasquatch in europe which is quite interesting he's he's dug up some accounts that you know even i found uh uh you know unusual i thought well i haven't you know there's, there's one from croatia for instance and just yeah. areas that a lot of people haven't really dug into so i think that's everyone I, myself of course uh, i've got a long piece in there uh, this time around um, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I think we ended up uh, seven seven contributors this time. Fantastic, and that what once again, sort of later January or early Feb. Yes, yes. Brilliant. Well, I wish you continued success, and I look forward to ordering both on Amazon. <laughs> so, <laughs> David, uh, thank you for your time today. Where can everybody keep up to date with your work, and obviously uh, pre-order the books if required? EerieLights.com. That is E E R I E. L-I-G-H-T-S dot com, eerie dot com. That has uh, all, all the links you'll need are right there. There's uh, news about upcoming releases. There's I, I put exclusive articles on there. Uh, there's links to other shows I've done. Uh, there's uh, event listings. Uh, there's a contact form if somebody has a, a story about a creepy doll or a cryptid or anything else related to this field they want to shoot over to me, please do so. Um, there's also, I'll throw this in there, I'm also pleased to announce that I um, am involved with a series that is coming out. It will debut in the spring from Seth Breedlove. Yep. Uh, this one is On the Trail of UFOs. And uh, there's a, a current trailer uh, linked up on my website. You can check that out. Uh, Shannon is involved in that. She's 
she's the host sort of traveling around, but mm-hmm. uh, they used me for a lot of commentary in the in the series, so I'll be featured in that also. Oh, brilliant! I knew you'd I knew you were appearing in it, David, but I'm delighted to hear you've got uh, a slightly larger part. And I know Shannon, obviously, uh, good friends and and always kept up to date with what she's up to and obviously with Seth and everything. So I must admit, I was I was delighted as always when I see people I respect appear on their trailers, and you were one of them. So that's that's excellent news, David. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh, so yeah, and lots welcome. lots of other stuff coming next year. So. Uh... Check the website; it stays updated pretty frequently, and uh, that's, that's the best way to keep up with me. Fantastic. Well, thank you for your time, as always, sir. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for uh, taking me down a uh, a very eerie trip uh, in the <laughs> world of haunted dolls. And uh, we once again remind you: we try not to offend Robert. So apologies if he takes offence to what we say. <laughs> um, that's not our intention oh, at that, all. That that would be. Take offense at what you said. <laughs> <laughs> just just a point of clarity there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry <laughs> Before again. Before you get to bed tonight. <laughs> okay, yeah. On David's behalf, I say sorry from me, Paul, there, Robert, <laughs> and uh, thank you for that. So, David, thank you, and, and thank you for uh, for just reassuring my mind there for tonight's <laughs> uh, <laughs> attempt to go to sleep. Been a pleasure as always. You take care. Have a great festive period, and uh, all the best with the books in the new year. Great talking with you, Paul. You have a great holiday season, and we'll talk again soon.